This is Craig Scott, who is the uh, developer of iThoughts, which um, in my mind and my opinion has been one of the best things to happen to mind mapping in recent years. Um, Craig has pretty much single-handedly, I think, um, put a lightning bolt into the mapping world in some ways. So I'm delighted to have him here, and he also get, wins the prize for best title for a presentation. <laughs> so I'll hand you over to Craig Scott for uh, touchy-feely mind mapping. Okay, thank you. I'm feeling a bit sleepy now with sandwiches and stuff. Um, my name, as, as, uh, as Liam said, Craig Scott, and I'm the director of my thoughts, the mind mapping app, the iPad and iPhone. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so for the next 20, 25 minutes, depending on my bit, um, I'm going to talk briefly about my thoughts, uh, give you a quick history of, of, sort of uh, where I come from with it. I'll then talk a bit about uh, tablets and why I think they're different from what we've had before, basically, from the laptops. I'll then talk a bit about uh, why I think the killer app is, I guess, uh, for tablets. And then I'll talk a bit about the futures, or, or a future that I might like predict tablets. So, I'll declare my interests initially. Um, I just developed for Apple at the moment. Uh, there's no ideological stance on that, they just play the best at the moment. Um, so I think much of what I'm going to talk about applies to Android, to Windows and BlackBerry and that kind of stuff, but I'm going to use the word iPad and tablet interchangeably. So uh, I apologize in advance if there's any Android people that probably don't know Apple. Um, so in the beginning, about uh, 2008 it was, uh, I was working as uh, for a technology company developing IVR systems, and those touch-tone telephone systems that everybody hates. And you can bring a machine and ask the person one or two. I apologise for that now. <laughs> um, I've, I've probably wasted more time than those people. Um, I was a bit bored in the job at the time. About the same time that Steve Jobs announced the iPod Touch and the fact that there's going to be an app store. So I thought I'd have a little bit of a, a hobby. Uh, I thought I'd have a go writing an app over the summer. And because I was using FreeMind at work, for uh, doing brainstorming to do this and like, I thought I'd have a go at writing a sort of free mind equivalent uh, on the iPod Touch. So I worked in the evening all summer and finally released my thoughts uh, in the October of that year, um, about a month after the App Store opened for me. It was the, actually the second mind mapping app to hit the App Store, uh, and it did okay. It, it, it made enough money for me to buy an iPhone, paid for some holidays, and kind of And I, I learned a lot from the experience. Um, Previously, working for a big software, uh, big software company, I was quite detached from customers. There would be sales guys, pre-sales, all those guys between me and the customer. All of a sudden now, I was creating something, and I was dealing directly with the people who had paid for the app. So I learned a huge amount. And so that's the, that's the first incarnation of iThoughts on the iPhone. A bit minimalistic, a bit black and white. Uh, then 18 months later, about this time of year, before Steve Jobs announced the iPad. I thought, this is going to be amazing. It was okay working on the iPhone, but it's a bit of a small screen. But the iPad, now this is, this is going to be a, a game changer. So I frantically uh, ported iPhones over onto the iPad and released it. I was, going to, I, was, I was not going to be the second iPad app in the store this time. And I released it pretty much on day one when the iPad was, was available in America. A whole month before I'd even seen an iPad. I took a risk and just developed it on a simulator and put it on the store. Uh, it was great. It sold really well. Uh, to the point where, after a couple of three months, I was making enough money that I could consider giving up my day job. So having a young family and a mortgage and all that goes with that, I gave up my day job <laughs> <laughs> to work full-time on iPhones. As my wife said, I walked away from a perfectly good job to go and play with iPhones in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think I was a bit more strategic than that. I think there's probably a bit of a midlife crisis going on as well. So. Um, so yes, 18 months after that, I, I quit my day job working on iPods full time. And now here we are, over four years since that first iPod now, and I'm still working on iThoughts. It's a bit more colorful, it's much more feature rich now than it was, um, and it's going great. I guess the big difference between now and then is that uh, then I think there were two or three apps on the App Store when I first started. Now I've counted over 30 iPad mind mapping apps. So competition is hotting up, but it's not, it's not that big a deal to say there's zillions of iPads at the moment, so it's, it's a big enough market that we can all, we can all start. So, what's so different about uh, iPads or tablets? I think it boils down to four things. I think there's obviously the physical aspect of it. 
There's the demographic, the kind of people who are using iPads and using it apps. There's the expectation that those users have of tablets and apps. And there is a whole different business uh, model for developing apps, the whole app store. So when I say what's so different, I mean what's so different between tablets and essentially notebooks, desktops, and windows. Okay. I think there are some fundamental differences that, that, that make tablets perfect. So the physical uh, um, aspect of it, the first thing obviously is uh, the mobileness of it. I would say laptops are portable devices, tablets and phones certainly are more personal devices. People tend to have more of a, uh, an emotional relationship even, certainly with a phone. You know, some, it's like you've lost an army if you get the phone. Tablets increasingly are being like that. You only have to look at, at the nice cases people wrap them in. You know, they have an emotional attachment. It's much more so than they do with the laptop. And what that means is that people have tablets and phones uh, with them more of the time, which I think is important when it comes to my mind. Touch. That, I believe, is the most fundamental aspect of tablets. Uh, and touch, again, it, it, it extends that emotional attachment you have with this device. You're actually interacting with it with your finger. It just, it, it cements that emotional attachment you have with the device. It's obviously more intuitive. Uh, oh, sorry. It's more natural, and it should be more intuitive if the apps are developed correctly. And I would argue that it's also more immersive. You've got, you've got less between you and your stuff. So on, when you're working on a laptop, you've got the indirection of a mouse and a keyboard and a screen. On a tablet, you actually have the thing in your hand and you're interacting with your stuff directly with your finger. So it's much more immersive, which again, I think, helps with the mind mapping uh, side of things. There are some downsides to touch. Um, touch restricts touch. The, the, the nature of touch is that um, you can have fewer elements on the screen. Your finger is a finite size, so the buttons you have on the screen have to be spaced out a certain, a certain distance, which means, especially given the smaller screen, you've got fewer UI, uh, fewer things you can tap on the screen. You also find that your finger is less accurate than a mouse, especially given that as you go to touch something on the screen, you actually cover up what it is you're about to touch. It's not something you get with a mouse. With a mouse, you can actually see the button you're about to click, and you can see the, the point you're going to click it. And you can have much smaller buttons on the you can have much, many more options in front of you. The great thing about touch is, is it reduces those number of options, the number of options that are available to you, which instantly reduces the complexity of the app. So all of a sudden, apps now are inherently less scary, less complex than their desktop equivalents. The um, This, this, this means that app developers <coughs> now need to think more carefully. In the old world, uh, take Word for example. If you added a new feature to Word, you would simply add a new button or a new ribbon bar, and it would just get bigger and bigger and bigger, which is fine because you've got a mouse and you can click on these things. In an app, when you develop a new feature, you have to think more carefully about uh, whether you've got space on the screen to put the button in order to administer that feature. Which means that you as the app developer have to think more deeply about how people really want to use your app. Because you have to distill it down into something that fits within those 10 buttons that you can perhaps get across the top of the screen. And that's great, because it forces app developers, rather than just to cram features in, you have to think about truly what people want to be able to do with the application, and what isn't quite as relevant. A good example of that is in iPhones. So on your standard desktop mind map app, you can typically set if you were to set the colour on a branch, you would typically there are three variables you can set. You can set the line colour, the fill colour, and the text colour. Not only that, you can set it to a whole myriad of colours, a whole any colour you like. To my mind, that's a bit of an engineering approach. That's you, you make it configurable because you can, and because there's plenty of space on the screen. To my iPhones approach, and from the tablet approach, I can't waste three buttons and all the stuff that goes with it on just setting the colour. So take the iPhones for example, I put it down to one button select the colour with. And I then choose, and I, I set the, uh, the, the line colour and the fill colour and all, all those other colours automatically. And I also choose the correct text colour so that it looks okay on, on the, uh, the contrast. And what I'm doing there is I'm taking, 
in, in addition to reducing the complexity, I'm taking away some of the cognitive load on the users. So previously, you would have to think about what colors go well together. <laughs> what I'm doing now is I'm saying, you just have to pick the sort of red, and I'll make sure the contrast is right and the colors look good together. So another, uh, another sort of uh, uh, byproduct of, of simplifying the user interface is that I'm actually reducing the cognitive load on the users, which again makes the app so much easier to use. So that's the, that's the advantage of touch. It forces you to create simpler apps and easier to use apps. Uh, the final thing is, um, they're not seen as computers. If you, um, <coughs> people treat um, uh, tablets differently to computers. They're, they're very much more pick me up and put me down in devices. And you see that at a conference. You'll have people with laptops that will sit there and they'll be up all the time and they'll be sort of multitasking, looking at the laptop, looking at the conference. Whereas if you see people with tablets, they'll have them down and it gets to the boring bit, I'll put the tablet up and I'll use it, and I'll put it down again. So it's very much more a sort of pick me up, you put me down device. So those are the three physical differences I would say between uh, uh, laptops and tablets. The demographic, the users of tablets. I get, I get emails uh, from all sorts, from little kids, through to CTOs of companies, through to students, through to the elderly people, Chrome users, uh, total technophobes, the whole gamut of people. And they're all using the same app and the same hardware. And I don't think you tend to get that in the PC laptop world. Apps tend to be targeted at either pro users or kids or you know, specific demographics. In the tablet world, the whole demographic are all using the same app and the same, uh, the same physical platform, which creates some interesting um, challenges for, for, for app developers. So you have to be able to make it not scary to be You have to make it um, uh, pleasant enough for the, for the child, not noddy, not too noddy for the, for the pro user. Um, the other thing is the expectation that those um, that, that demographic have. It sounds a bit cheesy, and it sounds a bit sort of apple-y, but they expect delightful, simple, and beautiful from their apps. Okay. Now. That is very different from the, from the PC world, where take Word, for example, that is neither delightful, simple, nor <laughs> <laughs> They had an attempt at delightful a few years ago with the, with the clipping thing, but they're not delightful, simple, or beautiful. So again, that's another fundamental difference, I think, between the software you'll see on tablets and the software you'll see, you'll see on the desktop. I can still, with the delightful thing, I can still remember the first time I saw an iPod Touch, and you scrolled it, and, you had, and, and it slowed down, and it bounced to the top of the screen. At the time, that was just absolutely mind blowing. Coming from a Nokia LCD screen to see this was just amazing. And that, I must have sold 10 to my friends to show them. Look at the scroll. The other expectation that, that, that people have now is that apps are cheap or free and you get updates for life. That's something I'll talk a bit more about in the business side <coughs> in a second. But those are expectations that Apple have set. So the business, I won't spend too much time on this. But um, due to the expectations of, uh, that Apple have set, it's a low margin, high volume game. You have to sell lots of apps, which is why when I talked about the demographic before, you have to appear, appeal to the good demographic. <coughs> and it's a cute consumer market. The people that buy apps now are not the buying departments of companies. They're, they don't tend to be the pro users. The vast majority of my customers are what I call them, straight consumers which again uh, influences the direction of the app as we go. And the business is a precarious business as well. All my revenue comes, comes by Apple. If they choose to uh, shut me out of their app store, that's it, my business is over. Uh, it's also limited in that respect in that uh, I can't do much marketing, I can't offer bulk discounts, I can't get paid upgrades, I can't have a reseller model. My whole setup is via the app store and Apple absolutely control that. Well, that's something that's, that's it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out, especially some of the larger companies. It's okay for me working at home on my own, but I'm not sure I'd want to employ too many people and take out premises or too many loans based on such a precarious business model. So the future, this has been banded around the internet. I don't, I don't think I believe the numbers, there are no numbers. Um, but apparently this is the year when tablet sales are going to exceed notebook sales. So, According to that metric, tablets are, are the future. 
And the perfect killer app, I think you can all guess what that is, it's my mind. And the reason for that, I would argue, and this, this harks back to a bit about what Chris said earlier, the whole iPad, the whole tablet thing is designed to be distraction free. It's designed such that this thing is just a window onto your stuff. Okay? Which is exactly what um, Chris was saying earlier, where you, you shouldn't be thinking about the app or the user interface, you should just be thinking about the process. And that's what tablet kind of model enables. Uh, it's immersive, as I said before, you're actually touching, interacting directly with your stuff. You get immersed in it, which is perfect for my mind. You just concentrate on, on your ideas. Another one is, that, the other thing that makes it such a, a great platform for mind mapping is, is the old best camera argument. What's the best camera? It's the one you have with you at the time. And since these devices are now with us all the time, phones are always with you, increasingly tablets will be with you. Be they sitting in your living room and they're on the coffee table, or you're in the bar downstairs, and you will have your tablet with you, just playing on it. Um, and that's when you tend to have your ideas now. As we all become more knowledge workers, we're having our ideas and our, our best thoughts in places that aren't work, aren't sat at desk. They might be on the train, they might be in the bar, they might be at home, in the living room. So it's just a perfect fit for my mapping. And finally, you know, what's more delightful, beautiful, and simple than my mapping? <coughs> That's what it is. One of the themes of this conference is mainstream. I would argue that with the advent of iPads and uh, cheap apps and implicitly easy to use apps, we're lowering we're, we're, we're better and less, as, as I've said there, uh, better and less complex tools, cheaper tools, and many more people doing my mind can't help but drive mind mapping into the mainstream. And if you look at what they're doing with iPads in schools now as well, um, even local comprehensives around us are now starting to roll out iPads to the school kids. And the kind of apps they're putting on there are mind mapping type apps. So it's not going to be long before those kids work their way through the college system up into business and mind mapping. I don't think it can fail to go mainstream. Um, and tablets are going to be one of the, one of the, uh, the things that push that. So, uh, that was my talk. I think I'm two minutes under. So, uh, I probably missed something out. Um, thanks for listening and not sleeping. Uh, if anybody has any questions. Uh